I want to start our first study on Philippians chapter 2, which is known as the love chapter. Right, but the point I want to try to bring out here is defining the very essence and characteristics of what a Christian is and how that is brought about in your life through a change that takes place in your life through the operation of the Holy Spirit of walking in the righteousness of Christ. But this is going to take a series of teachings. This is not going to all be able to fit into this one. There's a lot here. But we will start right here in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1. If you have any questions, ask. If anything, you know, just write them down. Every time I finish a, uh, a verse, you, you can ask. You know, ask anything. If I don't know the answer, I won't make it up. I just say I don't know and I look it up and you know, give it later. You'd be surprised when I used to teach before the questions people ask catch you way off guard. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. Now I usually don't bring this up, but the word therefore is important here because Paul uses that form of speech probably more than anyone else in the Bible. Wherefore or therefore. But it has some meaning here I want to show. Because that word therefore refers to back to chapter 1 verse 27 where it says only let your conversation be as if it come with the gospel of Christ that rather I come and see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit that's the spirit of Christ with one mind in the unity of that spirit striving together for the faith of the gospel now as you read 28 through 30 in chapter 1 you see why Paul was writing this letter from prison and I could just picture Paul heart being grieved and so worried about his brothers and sisters in Christ because the church was going through a persecution so Paul mind as you enter chapter 2 it's on unity because without unity everything breaks down rather it's a family or a body of Christ in unity in the church. If it's not in proper unity, everything will, will break down. And I, I throw some things in that a little bit. So when he says, if there be, be therefore any consolation in Christ, Christ being the source of that consolation. And that consolation means, if you look it up, a lifting up, a... Uh, to console somebody, to come to some put your arms around them and uplift them, encourage them in Christ, no matter what difficulties, no matter what things they're going through in their lives, to encourage them. Christ being the source of that encouragement. In fact, that consolation there is very closely related. I think it's in John chapter 16 where Jesus said, when I go, I send back the comforter. Words are very, almost intertwined, very close related. But that there is referring to the, the Holy Spirit coming, you know, into your life. And we're here it's referring to another person that uplift you, that encourage you in Christ when you need it. In fact, what I'm speaking is making me think of uh, Martin Luther King said one time. He seen a young man walk down the street. Hung down, down low, dragging his feet, bent back. He got upset. He poor side around and says, Young man, what's your problem? He says, Pastor, I've been bent down so low for so long that being down just don't bother me no more. He says, Young man, straighten your back and raise your head and walk like a man. And Christ Jesus, who counted all joy, endured the cross. And I didn't mean to go this way. Let me show you something on that. Sometimes I start on something, my mind goes someplace else, and that's what's happening right now. In Hebrews chapter 10, no, chapter 12 in Hebrews, in, chapter, in verse 2, chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 2, it says, 
Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But the point I want to show you, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How can anybody know what he was about ready to go through? Count it all joy. I struggled with that too. I realized Christ looked for the end resolve of what his death would bring to us. And we should do the things when we go through trials and tribulations in our life. If our focus is right on Christ and him crucified, those things ain't going to bother us because our focus upon the end results of what these things will have in our life. It's just when we get our focus off of Christ and the cross and get it on self, then it's all about me, 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 I, 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 your worries, you're the, you know what I'm saying? It's all about me, and then you have all this frustration in your life. I don't know how I got off on that, but a point I was trying to make, when you see a brother or a brother or sister in Christ, say you drive down the road and you look and you see them do something wrong or, or they swear at somebody, or, it could be numerous of things. The point is, you don't run home and get on the phone, and they justify it now by saying, Christians do, by saying, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so, and they spend two hours, two hours gossiping about the person in no time in prayer. A true person that has, has a real change to the operation of the Holy Spirit in their life. When they see another brother or Christian at fault or in error or just outright sin, there will be a weeping in their spirit for them to want to pray for them. They would go to that person, you know, come on brother, come on sister. I've been there too. But together, uplifting one another, encouraging each other in Christ, we can make it together. We can do it. The last thing a Christian needs in their life, and the walk is not always easy, as anybody that serves the Lord would know, is somebody to step on their neck and beat up on their chest and say, thank God I'm not like other men. And that's what basically the church world has done because it's all a form of, there we go, back to self. Whenever you focus on self, it's elevate self and make self look a little better. And when self is self-elevated, Where's the Holy Spirit in your life? It's dormant. It can't operate. It can't function because self is self-elevated. And that's where you find a lot of people are at today that feels always trying to serve the Lord, but it's always an outward show of thinking, if I don't do this, if I don't swim on Sunday, if I don't wear shorts, you know, it's all pleasing the God, and they totally really miss to really mark what it's all about. It's about an inner change that takes straight place, takes place in your life through the operation of the Holy Spirit to a point where you even see a brother or sister in Christ that is an heir at fault, outright sin. There's a weeping in your spirit, like a gushing. It's like falling in love for the first time. And there's a burning where you want to pray for that person. You want to help them. You want to uplift them. You want to encourage them in Christ because you care about that person. You know, because of an inner change that has taken place in your life. But this cannot happen by your own strength and your own ability. It has to be through the operation of the Holy Spirit that has brought that change. And I, we get into that maybe in another teaching. I don't want to get too far off from this. But that consolation here is uplifting and encouragement in Christ that we should be given to one another. Keeping our focus that Paul's talking about unity here. In the body of Christ because the church was going through persecution. Any comfort of love. This love here is not like I love you because you love me. That's the worldly type of love. Oh, you mad at me? I don't like you. That, that's the worldly type of love. This is kind of love that the best way to explain it, it's the same type of love that had Christ had for us on the cross. When we could care nothing about him. Whatever, they mean nothing to us. Christ still came and died for us. And what did that show us? It showed us a very unselfish love. A love that always put others before self. And that's the type of love that we should have in our lives one for another. 
If Christ came and did that for us when we care nothing about him, how such of a small little thing of it is for us to have mercy and compassion and tender emotions one for another? How can we save the lost dying world when they can't see a change in your life? When all they can see is your backbiting, your gossip, and you act like the world. The only difference is you go to church on Sundays. Why do they want what you got? They already got what you got. They don't, you know, you see what I'm getting to? But there's a real change that takes place in your life when you're really walking in Christ and being led of the Holy Spirit. And not just found a religious doctrine, which is nothing more but rules and regulations, which you think is pleasing to God. Because there are rules and regulations. Thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not. But we don't do those things because the Bible, uh, okay, the Bible says in Romans 10, give a small, we get into this stuff a little deeper later. If, in Romans 12, if you see your enemy's hunger, feed him, see, see him thirst, give him a drink. Now, some Christians will regrettably incite, oh, I can't do it. Well, God's going to be pleased with me, so they go ahead and do it for that person. God's not impressed. But if you're doing it because there is a real inner change in your heart where you're just a burning for that enemy of yours because you realize he is what he is because of sin, and you want to do everything you can for him, then God is well pleased with your actions because your motives or intentions are right. It goes right back to the intent of the heart. Are you doing it because of an inner change? Are you doing it because you're trying to please God? I got another star in my crown, you know, that type of a deal. So there's I just love here. It's a special kind of love that only can be placed in our lives by the operation of the Holy Spirit. It's not the worldly type of love where I love you because you love me or I like you because you like me. That's... That's, in fact, I think that really type of love, if you look the word philosopher up, philosopher, yeah, uh, philosopher, you can trace that word back to the same word, to the word worldly type of love. I thought that was kind of interesting, really. And it goes on to say, if any fellowship of the Spirit, now we read that, and we just you know, keep on reading, but actually, when I look at the history on this, that fellowship of the Spirit, they really understood a little bit more deep what Paul was saying. Because back in Hebrew times, all the different villages, or you could even use the word tribe, would gather together. They used to have this fountain in the middle of a square full of alcohol beverage, uh, intoxicating of one kind or another. And he stepped this big cup into it and raised it high in the air and said, we are all of one village. And we all drink of one fountain, showing the unity that the different tribes and different people had together. How much greater is the unity here if we all in the same spirit and the same love of Christ and the, the same tender emotions and compassion one for another in the body of Christ? Man, can you imagine how God can move? Can you imagine what the body of Christ would be if a sinner came into your church and you had that true unity there, that true love and tender emotion went for another man, it would just wipe them off their feet. But instead a sinner comes in to hear this one of her gossiping about this person, this one of her telling an off color joke, man, he's gonna feel comfortable right at home. Why should he change your his life? You got the same thing he has. The only difference you got is is religion. You don't have a relationship, but they feel going to church every week somehow means they got a relationship with God. Or, or they pray 10, 10 hours a day, every day of the week. Oh, I got totally missing. It's not about you doing anything, but it's about you allowing the Holy Spirit to have operation in your life that will bring about a total inner change where people will see the outward effect of it in your life. It's not you striving to be something you're not. That that make any sense? Any fellowship should have any bows and mercies. So it's like I had myself right there a little bit, but the bows and mercies, when you look it up in the Greek, it referred to tender emotions and compassion. If we're all truly in that same spirit in the unity of Christ in our personal life. There's going to be just a unity in the body of Christ where we're going to 
help one another financially. We're going to help one another spiritually. When we see our brother fall, there's going to be such a weeping in our hearts to want to encourage that person to get back on track. Uplift him in the things of, of the Lord. You don't need to step on his neck and beat him down into the ground. He already knows he's in sin. That's between him and God. You know, the last thing a falling brother or sister needs is somebody to step up on their neck and beat up on their chest. Is I thank God I hate like other men. That's self elevation. All points of you want to put yourself on a pedestal to make yourself look a little bit holier, a little bit more righteous. When you get that form of mind, you're totally missing. God, you're totally missing the whole picture. Now, you have any questions on verse 1 before we uh, go on to verse 2? Huh? No. I see you had something written down there. But... <laughs> you sure? No, I'm sure. Okay. Now, verse 2, it says, and this is simpler, how much time we got, okay. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Again, Paul is speaking of unity here. You're stressing the point of unity. Verse 3, it says, let nothing be done. Now, he's showing, I can see Paul showing the opposite of that unity as you enter in verse 3, where he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglorying. But in loneliness of mind, what's that loneliness of mind? Humility. Humility. Let each other esteem others better, better than themselves. I read verse 4 of this because it goes to go together. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This is what Paul's saying, not to have strifes and contention. In the body of Christ, if you got somebody that can sing really well, someone else can play the guitar, don't use your God-given gift to try to outdo everybody else or to show off. If there's somebody that can't play as good as you, encourage him in the things of the Lord in his gift. Maybe show him a, a few things. The last thing he needs you to do is try to outdo one another to look better. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But do everything. In unity, having, having the, I guess it comes down to having the true spirit of love and compassion for one another. Because if you don't have this, and you got verse 3, and you're doing that thing, having the strife and contention, what you have is what happened over in Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to try to get through this part of it anyways. In chapter 5, he said, It is reportedly commonly... That there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as name among the Gentiles, but pretty bad. That one should have his father's wife. Now, verse 2 is the key here. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather moan, that ye that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Here there was sin. In the body of Christ, currently everybody or great number of them knew it, but in their own self-righteousness, no one cared. No one cared. If you read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians, what we eventually do, you find, one, they was full of spiritual gifts. Paul had to straighten it out in later chapter, I think chapter 15, 6, someplace in there, Paul, Paul had to straighten them up on it. He also had a promise with who is the better teacher. Paul had to deal with that. He also had a promise at the Lord's Supper where the Jews, the circumcision was set on one side, the non-circumcision on, on, on one side, the slaves on one side, the rich on another, totally in chaos, totally divided. And there's such a division in the church that there was no unity there and when you don't have unity what happens you have a breakdown in the body of Christ there's all kind of sin going in, on in the body and nobody cares and that's basically what kind of church churches you have today oh that's okay as long as they in the church God let God deal with it totally missing it T totally missing 
And that's why you don't see the unity in the body of Christ. But have you ever been to churches? And I don't think I've seen, been to one church yet that don't have it. It's because it's not being taught. But they got little cliques in the church. Everybody got their own little cliques like you do when you're in high school. But there's, there's no really unity in the body of Christ. Where everybody's function as one. Well, duh, why not? Because they ain't in the true spirit of Christ. They're in the spirit of religion thinking they have Christ, but they don't have Christ because there's no inner change in your life. They have change in, in a way of religious doctrine, making it all about doing something. It's just being who they should be and being in Christ. But just being who you are and being in Christ has to do with eternal change that has taken place like, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Now we get into that a little bit later as well as we continue on, on this study. I see him at 20 minutes. So I would stop here and uh, I thank you for your time and uh, hope you enjoy this. Well, hope you had not something coming. I know you're a little shy and asking questions because uh, it's your first time, but I'm sure you get over that quickly enough. Thank you for your time and thank you for coming. And hope you all got something from it.